Terry says this, uh, Starmer's 40,000 extra appointments a week. Sounds impressive until you crunch the numbers. 40,000 each week equals 5,714 per day. 854 hospitals in England means just seven extra appointments per day per hospital. Doesn't sound too great to me. Well, when you put it like that, uh, maybe it does actually sound achievable. Seven new appointments per hospital per day. Let's see what Rob Merrick thinks of that. Rob, a very good morning to you. Good morning. I mean, the NHS obviously has always been the battleground, hasn't it, on most uh, elections? I mean, we, I can't remember the last time somebody didn't say we've only got 24 hours to save the NHS. I mean, Snummer hasn't said it yet, uh, but he probably will say it, presumably, uh, on July the 3rd or thereabouts. Um, but breaking down the numbers here, 40,000 extra appointments a week, if it does actually break down to what Perry says, seven extra appointments per day per hospital in England, it is actually probably doable, isn't it? Uh, yes, I'm very impressed with um, Perry's maths there. I think he's absolutely, <laughs> absolutely nailed it. Uh, the um, striking thing about the NHS promise is not that it's ambitious particularly or that it looks unachievable, but it's actually incredibly modest. It probably will be achieved, but it will, will certainly won't make much difference to everybody's everyday experience with the NHS, which, as you quite, quite rightly point out, is miserable. And uh, the general feeling that the NHS is in stark decline. So... Of course, what Labour's strategy is to be is to be cautious during this campaign, to not frighten the horses, to not give the impression they're about to raise your taxes significantly, get into office, hope to make small gains, and then hope to be in a position to, to make big improvements over the next five or even ten years. Because, of course, of course Keir Starmer has co talked about this being a ten-year project. So right. anybody expecting a quick turnaround in the NHS will be disappointed. What Labour is aiming for is over years to be able to put the NHS back where they believe it was when they last left power. Yes, indeed. And, I mean, of course, the trouble is is that you never quite know who to believe, do you? Because, I mean, the Daily Mirror today uh, have got a splash uh, front-page story that says we'll end 8am GP scramble. They're going to try and get rid of uh, that ridiculous situation where people either have to queue up outside a GP surgery or try and get through on a phone, which is practically impossible, just to get an appointment. But they also say top medics warn Tory cuts have shattered the NHS. Now, you know, as far as I'm aware, there's an awful lot more money going to the NHS now than there's ever been. They've actually got more doctors and more nurses than they've had uh, for the past 10 years. And yet, all of the extra money doesn't seem to be making any difference. In fact, if anything, it's getting worse. I think it's wrong to say that there's more and more money going into the NHS. Now, that might be true. Well, it is true in absolute terms. Well, it is true. I mean, that's what but, I mean. Well, yeah, but the, the significant, the, the key thing is that the NHS has always needed to have above inflation pay increases because we have not only a growing society, but more importantly, an ageing society, which relies on the NHS so much more. So therefore, over time, the NHS is pay, uh, budget needs to increase more than inflation. And right. over the last 14 years, it's increased by less than inflation. No, in fact, it, in no, but inflation's now at 2%, Rob. So actually, that's yes, probably it, no longer true. It might have been true when inflation was all the way up at 10%, um, okay, when, they were ask, when they were asking for above inflation increases above 10%. It looks ridiculous. You know, above inflation increases above 2%, not so ridiculous. Well, inflation has been 2% for about two weeks. Before that, of course, it was very, very high. Yeah, but, before, but, but for a long time before it went high, it was very low. But if you look back over the last 14 years, the NHS has received much smaller increases to its budget than it had before that, and that is why the NHS is in the desperate state that it is. I think the interesting... Well, there's many reasons why the, the NHS is in a desperate state, but the fact remains that it's not true to say it's got less money than it's ever had because it's actually got more money. You can make the argument that it's not worth as much, but it's still got more money. Do you know what I mean? These are the things that people pick up on when politicians speak and when doctors speak and when they kind of misspeak, because it's a bit misleading, really. Well, there's obviously many different ways to use statistics. I think the most misleading thing is to say the NHS has more money than it's ever had before. That's not a meaningful statement. No, but it's true, though. Matters, you keep saying matters, it's not meaningful, but it is true. What matters is how that relates to the size of the population and the needs of the population. Well, that's we good. A that's a good thing to, to, to point out as well, because very few members, uh, particularly of the Labour Party, ever say one of the reasons the NHS is under a great deal of strain is because there's an awful lot more people here. There's about 10 million more people here, and many of them have come here uh, from other countries, right? Because our population is actually in decline. You know, more statistics, which you can twist and turn any which way you want. But the other bottom line for me on the NHS, and even people in the NHS say this, you know, 50% of the people employed in the NHS don't do anything medical. 
Uh, I've not seen that stat. I, that I is don't true. You that. But you of course you would expect me not to give you a full stat, Rob, surely. I mean, I would not do that. So, you know, it's true to say that they... Of course you wouldn't. I, f- I don't know who's given you the stat. That's all I'm saying. Right. But well, it's, well it's, it's, an, it's an NHS stat. Because mm-hmm. if you look up the NHS, they'll tell you exactly how, how many nurses, okay. how many doctors, how many managers, how many clinicians they employ. And they employ a great deal of administrators. And that's part of the problem. Mm. Uh, yes, I think everybody want, we want to see as many of the NHS staff as possible actually on the front line doing treatment. That probably goes without saying. That's mm. presumably something that could change. I, I, you make the point, of course, that immigration has put, push, picked up, they've pushed up rather, the number of people who might require treatment depend on the NHS, and that's true. But yes. of course, the important flip side to that is that so many of those people who've come here have come to work in the NHS. Yeah, but do you know, do you know how many? Time. Because we hear, that's another story we hear all the time, and loads of people have come here. Many people have come here on visas, that's true. Um, but we don't really know the number. A vast number. And the majority... A vast the, number, yeah, but we don't know what the number is, do we? The biggest reason for the increase in social care visas, uh, sorry, in visas people coming here to work, is to work in social care. Mm -hmm. Imagine the state of our NHS and social care if we did not have those immigrants. I can't imagine it would be any worse, to be honest. To be honest, Rob, I can't imagine it would be any worse than it is now. I mean, we hear stories every single day, horror stories of things that have happened to people who have tried to get help on the NHS and haven't been able to get it. But let's talk about something else, because uh, there's another big story today, and that is, of course, the betting scandal which is still rolling around uh, we've got a statement from craig williams who started it all oh no we haven't got it sorry we'll come back to that craig williams was the guy who initially kind of um admitted that he had uh, made a bet on the election the day before the election was announced um he's now saying he made an error of judgment the tory party have finally seemingly seen sense and decided to sort of disown him and various other people who are involved in in it if they are candidates but they've done it so late that they'll still appear on the ballot as Conservative MP sort of candidates, right? Yeah, that's the key point. I mean, of course, this scandal has now touched Labour, who've uh, had their own candidate. Yes, um, they're all at it. (laughs) Yes, the extraordinary situation of betting against himself. And, uh, uh, and of course, that's embarrassing for Labour, but I I think the key difference, of course, or at least Labour can claim it, is that they've taken immediate action against their MP by discerning him. As you quite rightly say, Mm. the Conservatives took more than a week yeah, take well, even more than that. I mean, Rishi Sunak was only in this building two days ago um, where he was talking about, oh, well, we don't yeah. want to interfere with the Gambling Commission's investigation and we don't want to prejudice a police investigation, so we're going to have to wait and see. But, of course, everybody who had a brain was going, well, you don't have to wait and see. Mm-hmm. You know, these are people who are running for your, your party. Whether they've broken the law or not isn't really the issue. They shouldn't have done what they did. Yes, yeah, so, and the, the key thing there is it then becomes not an issue about what the individuals did, but it becomes an issue about the Prime Minister's judgment. And, right. of course, his judgment has appeared to be faulty at so many times during this campaign, most obviously by ducking out of the D-Day celebrations. So once it zones in on the Prime Minister and his judgment, or lack of, it becomes much more serious for him. Can I say this, though, Mark? I don't yeah. know whether you think this as well. It's interesting that the betting scandal has now become... It seems to have been decided that it's not legitimate for, for politicians to bet on politics in any way. Right. Therefore, the former Scottish secretary is in trouble, even though he laid his bets many months ago, long right. before the decision was taken, rather than an issue of, of insider knowledge, which is right. how it started. And I wonder whether most people might think, if it is decided that no bets by politicians on politics are allowed, Maybe that's a bit too puritanical for yes. many. Well, yeah, I think so, because I think you can't ban people from betting. It's a perfectly mm-hmm. legal activity. But like insider trading, you can't ban people from buying stocks and shares. But if you've got insider knowledge, mm-hmm. that's or p- clearly or should be an offence, you know, um, in the same way that if, um, uh, you know, if you knew that your company was going public, um, you know, before everybody else did and you managed to get hold of some shares um, without telling anyone, that would be illegal. And so I think you're right. I don't, I don't understand why it's been it's sort of opened up to almost everybody else, because that's not really the story, is it? The story is who knew what the day before the election was announced to make a bet that would have initially gained them some money. Yeah, I think it's become a sort of hysteria, hasn't it? But isn't it? Hasn't it, brother? But you, as you quite rightly say, at the heart of it is still a very serious issue about alleged insider knowledge, yeah. whether Craig Williams, the other Conservative MP, and of course the Conservative aides who've also uh, taken a leave or taken a leave of absence from work, whether they knew in advance the date of the election and laid their bet with that knowledge. And I think we should remain focused on that. Yes. 
No, I totally agree with that. That seems seems like a good idea. There's a story this morning in the Telegraph, I don't know if you've seen this one, about Labour and Lib Dems uh, being accused of a secret pact over target seats. It says that some analysis have revealed uh, that Sir Keir Starmer and Sir Ed Davey are steering clear of each other's most winnable constituencies. I presume that means they're not campaigning in them? I'm not quite sure. Um, well, I, I would say that we knew that. This seems blatantly obvious to me. There, there's been a non-aggression pact between Labour and the Liber Liberal Democrats for several years. Right. They're not very far apart on policy. They both share an absolute desire to kick out the Conservatives, so therefore well, they will work quietly together to achieve that. So I don't think it will come as a surprise to anybody that they're right. steering clear of each other's target seats. That has been their clear strategy for several years. Right. And there's a head-to-head -head, uh, between Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer, I think, again tonight. I haven't seen any polls for a couple of days. Um, are we are we sort of avoiding polls these days now? Or yeah. are we, we can only enough? hope so. We can only hope so. We've definitely seen <laughs> enough, haven't we? Yes, I mean, tonight is... I guess Rishi Sunak's very last chance to turn things around, isn't it? It's on the national broadcaster. Mm. It will presumably get large viewing figures. He has to somehow change the tune tonight. He has to say or do something different. He has to make a breakthrough and mm. really hurt Keir Starmer. Otherwise, we know what's going to happen next week. And you can only suspect that we've heard all that we're going to hear in, here in this debate. Mm. We're not going to hear anything new and that Rishi Sunak hasn't really got any shots left to fire. Yeah. But tonight, tonight. I mean, in some ways, it would have been better if it was on last night because we could have avoided watching the football. At least it would been something else to, to, to look at, but there we well, are. given how bad the football, avoided the football <laughs> and watched the politics, maybe. Who knows? Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, absolutely right. It's good to talk to you, Rob. Thanks very much indeed. Rob Merrick, their political journalist, on the latest scenario. We did, of course, read out the candidates list earlier uh, for Central Suffolk and North Ipswich, as well as for Montgomeryshire and Glendower. Uh, we did that a little bit earlier in the show.